when somebody is looking for a supplement, what should they be looking for? Yeah, I think it's important to find a supplement that's DNA verified. And what that means is just that like you're basically verifying that the strains that are in the product or the ingredients in the product are actually in the product itself, which is not always easy to find. Um, and unfortunately, you just have to be a very vigilant consumer. You know, um, it's it's like you've got to call the company and ask them about their studies and their research. Um, and it, it's just, it's tough. It's difficult out there. So what was it about your strain that compelled you to take this whole thing on? I mean, I know that you said that there have been double blind studies, right? What did those studies show and why were you like, this needs to be out there? Yeah, the public? The- biggest difference with the spores that are used in Just Thrive is they are an endospore product. So they have this endospore shell around themselves. The majority of probiotics on the market, like 95% of them are not, they do not have this, they're not spore based. We were disruptors when we came to the market. The majority of probiotics are made up of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And they're very sensitive organisms by nature. You know, many need to be refrigerated. You know, some people will say like, oh, a good probiotic needs to be refrigerated to be alive. And it's like, well, maybe it needs to be refrigerated to be alive in the refrigerator. But what happens when it goes into your body, which is 98.6, which is much hotter than the you know, store shelf, which it can't even survive on the store shelf. How could it ever survive your body temperature, which is 98.6? And so the spores, the biggest difference between the spores is their ability to survive the gastric system. So we have the stomach acid. The stomach is meant to be the gastric barrier. It's very acidic. And most probiotics are killed in that stomach acid. And then they are dead on arrival when they get to the intestines. And and that doesn't mean that they don't do anything. I mean, people will say, I've had some luck with probiotics that are lactobacillus and bifidobacterium based, but it, they're not making a true change in that ecosystem. We want to think of our gut as this ecosystem. And most probiotics will just kind of pass through like food where the spores have the shell around themselves. They get to the intestines alive and then they make a true change in the gut lining. And it's it's why we see such incredible results with the product. You know, that's I was just on another podcast earlier and they would ask me like, well, you know, how, you know, you guys were bootstrapped. And I'm like, well, yeah, like really... When you have a product that works, it's amazing how quickly you could grow because, you know, it works and people, you don't have to do millions of dollars of marketing. You just have to have a product that works and people will do their marketing for you. I know. It's so crazy nowadays because it seems like everybody has a brand, regardless of what category they're in. And you see a lot of brands and their strategy is to be really good at marketing and have the product maybe be good enough for a repurchase, but not always. You know, it's it's yeah. interesting what people's um, kind of performance indicators are. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's scary because like a lot of those products sell really well, Yeah, <laughs> you know, because marketing sells, you know, but, you know, it's that's why we've been fortunate to be on podcasts like yours and like people, I could explain the difference. And I think it really resonates with people. And then they try it and they're like, oh, now I understand. And it, and it is so different than any other probiotics out there. I mean, it's a completely different category and it it, and it has so many effects on your overall health because of course we know our gut has so many effects on our overall health. Yeah. It's like the efficacy does the marketing for you. Yep. You don't have to be paying all of that to try to convince people. I'm just curious, like other brands where they do have to be refrigerated and they don't make it to the stomach alive or what is what is their rationalization for that? Well, I don't think any of those brands were like ill willed or anything. It's just based on what we used to know about the gut microbiome. The National Institutes of Health conducted the human microbiome projects about a project about 10 or so years ago, and it told us more about the gut than we ever knew before. And now we know how probiotics function in the gut, what uh, what we want them to do. We, we want a probiotic to get there alive and stay there for a while. Even if some of those probiotics do get there, even if some of the strains do get there, they actually pass through similar to like food passes through where the spores, when they get there, they go into their live state and then they stay there for about 21 to 28 days where they're making this true change in the gut. And I like to always use like the garden analogy. If you envision a garden that's been stepped on and trampled on and there's weeds growing all over that garden and you compare that to your gut, that's kind of the same thing that's going on with the the spores actually go in there, 
get rid of the overgrowth of the weeds and have the ability to bring those plants that have been stepped on and trampled on back to life. And so in our gut, it's going in there, getting rid of the overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria and then taking our good bacteria and bringing it back to life, which is which is what creates diversity. We want a diverse, lush microbiome. That is health. I mean, that is health on every level is having a diverse and lush microbiome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that another thing that consumers probably experience is a little bit of this feeling of being paralyzed. Like, can I take this kind of strange? Do I need probiotics? Do I not need probiotics? Am I getting enough probiotics from my food? Like all of these questions, a lot of people have conditions now like, you know, candida, yeast overgrowth, SIBO, and there's so much conflicting information out there. So I know that, you know, you can't give medical advice or anything like that, but is it just a rule in general that everybody can benefit from this? I would imagine that all of our microbiomes are just fucked right now because of yes. our yes. <laughs> exposures every day and our food and all of that. Yeah, no, that is a really good point because our microbiomes are really screwed up. I mean, we know that everything that we're doing in this world is like offensive to our gut health. So when we're talking about antibacterial soaps, antibacterial hand, san- hand sanitizers, antibiotics that are in our food supply, antibiotics that we take, glyphosate, which is the active ingredient Roundup, all these things that we're doing on a daily basis are just wreaking such havoc on our gut health. And it's why we're seeing this increase in allergies, autoimmune issues. I mean, kids now have epidemic levels of allergies. I mean, when I was a kid, I knew one classmate from, and obviously that was a long, long time ago, but from kindergarten all the way through the end of high school that had one classmate that had a Uh, peanut allergy. So, you know, I would argue that, yes, everybody needs to be taking care of their gut health. And it all depends on the type of probiotic. Spore-based probiotics are the same type of probiotic strains that our ancestors used to get off of the land. You know, our, our ancestors were hunter gatherers they would eat roots and tubers off the land and that those roots and tubers were teeming with this really beneficial bacteria and they were the spore based probiotics that's that's what was in our soil unfortunately now our soil is deplete of all those nutrients it's over farmed it's contaminated so we don't have the opportunity to get those really important strains um, but i do feel that I can't imagine anybody that wouldn't be benefit from taking a spore-based probiotic because of the fact that it is it's the way we evolved. And you bring up a good point about SIBO and other conditions where sometimes probiotics are not beneficial. I mean, there that is true. There are like certain lactobacillus type of probiotics that really contribute to, for example, in SIBO, the the overgrowth in the small bowel. So we know SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And sometimes probiotics, regular lactobacillus pro- probiotics, actually will go in there and contribute to that overgrowth in the small bowel. The spores don't, because what the spores do is they have something called cor- they do something called quorum sensing. So they are reading the microbial environment. So they are going to do something different in your gut than they are in my gut. So they go into the intestines or in that garden. They're like they're like the gardener of the gut. And they're like, okay, we're going to get rid of that overgrowth of the pathogenic bacteria. Maybe I have a certain kind of overgrowth of the pathogenic and you have a different one. So they're going to do something different. They're very intelligent bacteria. Then they go in there and take our good bacteria and help bring it back to life. So um, you do have to be careful, obviously, with some probiotics. I would imagine most probiotics are probably safe for most people. But there was a study that came out that showed that some of these probiotics will actually compete with your natural gut flora and not be able to um, you know, help fight an infection or fight something that's going on. So, you know, yes, you do have to be careful. I would say most probiotics are pretty safe and benign, but it's something to keep in mind. Where the spores we were meant to consume, our ancestors consume them on a daily basis. And it is why we see such incredible results with the product. 